uh, we'll start our uh, course, uh, which is uh, essentially on basics of squint amblyopia. And the, basic, the aim of this is to acquaint us and manage patients, which we see on a daily routine basis. So this will be, I'll be starting on refraction and prescription of glasses, and subsequently we'll go on to uh, the next set of topics. I'll request uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma to please come on the dais. Uh, Okay, uh, Dr. Ankur, uh, Dr. Tigvijay, if you could please come on the dais. So uh, I'll be talking on refraction and prescription of glasses. Uh, so the first question that we need to uh, understand is, why do we need to know? It's important because it's essential that we understand what is the appropriate vision at any particular age. When do we reach, when does the child reach adult levels so that we are able to understand whether the child's vision is subnormal or not, and if it is so, how do we investigate and manage it? So the process of emetropization, the infant's eye moves through a wide range of refractive errors. So uh, actually at start in infancy, although majority of the children are hyperopic with a mean of about three to four diopters, they can even be myopic in the early infancy. So there is a wide range of refractive errors a child may have in infancy. And during the first three years of life, there is a significant movement which may initially increase the hyperopia and then progressively move towards uh, emetropization. So initially there is an increase in the axial length and the cornea and lens lose their power by flattening and by three to six years, although there is not so significant change in the axial length, but dioptric power of the lens decreases and not so many changes in the cornea. So actually it's the changes in the lens in the th three to six years that start powering, change the power of the uh, eye and move towards emetropization. The development of vision is also not complete at birth. So rods and cones mature by four months after birth and visual myelination is continuing till one month after birth. And complete maturation of the pathway with complete myelination takes up to two years. So it's not that child is born with complete 6 6 vision. It may take up to two years depending upon the way we are measuring visual acuity that we would get visual acuity results. The important milestones, therefore, that we should be acquainted with is that at birth, the child is having uh, intermittently visual fixation. So the child will fix at a nearby target, often particularly a mother's face. So high contrast objects are the ones which a child can fixate on. Following, uh, and subsequently they will be following, so they will have some movements for following anything, including an optokinetic nystagmus. And any object, bright object, which the child can fixate on. By two to three months, he is fixating well on near objects, and the follow movements are smoother. By six months, the distance objects, uh, the child is able to fix on distance objects. The child is sitting now, often without support, and he's able to look at parents, objects which are fairly far away. By 18 to 24 months, the visual acuity reaches adult levels, particularly on uh, most visual system measurings. Uh, that we can do, and by five years, adult stereopsis levels are absolutely achieved. You can have different methods of measuring visual acuity. You have distant uh, detection acuity test where they're just being able to detect any object like candy beads or graded balls. They're, the other method is to see for resolution acuity, so whether they are able to resolve various objects into their particular, uh, into its components like using an OK and drum, using preferential looking tests I'll be showing you and pattern VEP. And subsequently, the, most, the best method, which is also most helpful for testing for amblyopia are recognition acuity tests, where a child is actually recognizing an object like Cardiff acuity, where there is an object which a child recognizes, Allen cards, toys, Landorth C, E, and finally, of course, uh, ETDR or Sosnellens. The, the change of visual acuity happens as, as they go again, like I said, it depends upon the method used. You can use OKN, preferential looking, or VEP. And this is the time by which uh, they achieve 6-6 six, six vision or adult visual acuity, depending again, you, the fastest achieved with VEPs because there are no responses required. You're actually testing the anatomical pathway. They see the pattern and you are getting the, uh, the results. So the earliest uh, achievement of visual acuity is on the VEP. The, the other methods to look is the Bruckner's reflex, where you can 
uh, identify any abnormality, either amblyopia or strabismus, and you look at the reflex and compare it between the two eyes. It's also in children easy to pick up whether they have amblyopia by doing the preferential, by uh, fixation preferences. Sometimes it's not easy to pick the visual acuity, but just by observing their behavior on covering of the either eye, you can see the left eye, there's hardly any resistance. So the right eye is the fixing eye, but the moment you cover the right eye, the child is extremely unhappy. So these are ways of indirectly being able to understand the presence of amblyopia. The teller acuity cards, uh, now of course the teller cards are available without uh, the, drum, the, uh, the sheet around it and its uh, uh, graded patterns are there of different sizes and distance and they are able to, you're able to compare that with the adult comparative visual acuity and it gives you in cycles per degree. So uh, that's uh, cycles per centimeter. So that's how you are comparing visual acuity in children. It's based on the preferential looking. So the child will look towards the pattern if you can see it. However, if the child is not being able to see the pattern, it resolves, it, it merges with the gray background. That's why the gray color of the cards. Similarly, the Cardiffs, they're called vanishing optotypes because if you are not able to see these objects, they vanish into the background. So it becomes an absolute gray and there is no place Place for the child to fixate. So there is, that's why the preferential looking. So the child looks preferentially to any object. And also that is why there is a limit to which these uh, cards are successful. They are useful for smaller children up to two and a half to three years, teller for more younger children from six months to one and a half years, and the card for a little older children. They, they bank upon the, the preferential looking behavior of the child. So they are behavior based and therefore in older children where we are not expecting this behavior to be a, a standard, they are not very useful. Others, of course, become the OK and DRUM. Uh, again, various charts of uh, forms and uh, again, Snellen's modifications of objects which can help to identify the visual acuity. For refraction, uh, uh, particularly in the presence of esotropia, we prefer atropine ointment, uh, particularly three times a day for three days. Uh, the preferred over drops because they, they less chances of uh, the, uh, the drug running down the nasal lacrimal duct and getting absorbed systemically. Uh, it causes blurred vision for a period and therefore it is important to inform the parents about this. Extremely important that most of what we call as side effects are essentially drug dependent toxicity and overdose is something you have to be very careful about. Drowsiness, flushing, uh, sometimes even uh, seizures and uh, fever is also something that is not uncommon. Home atropine and cyclopentylate are alternative. Cyclopentylate has particularly been used in the West as a replacement to atropine for refraction. However, we do find a significant CNS related toxicity with uh, cyclopentylate and therefore we still prefer atropine or the alternative of home atropine. Retinoscopy is extremely important. The child should be comfortable in the parent's lap. There should be, you should be bang straight ahead so that you avoid off axis errors and should have a preferably a little a fixation target in the distance. It's important to have the child comfortable and not scared or daunted. Prescribing for myopia, mild moderate myopia is a low risk for amblyopia as near vision is not affected and therefore we generally prescribe for higher myopes. I'll be showing you uh, the table that we use. Uh, again, uh, for astigmatism, powers above 1.5 to 2 diopters can be amblyopogenic and therefore it is important to prescribe them. Oblique, uh, oblique astigmatism, even more than 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopters are important and therefore need to be prescribed. Early school years, even one diopter of astigmatism is relevant and therefore it is essential that we identify astigmatism on our retinoscopy and correct for it. Anisometropia, hyperopic anisometropia is more amblyopogenic than myopic and therefore again that becomes important to early identify and treat. Myopia, more than three diopters is really uh, amblyopogenic because uh, till that time the child is able to use one eye for near. However, of course, if you identify you need to treat because binocularity is uh, essential. Bifocal glasses, normally this is what we give for adults but for children, especially when we're looking for uh, a convergence excess pattern, uh, plus four adds, uh, plus three add is given, which can be gradually tapered. They are large executive type, 
with line bisecting the pupil so that the moment the child's visual axis falls below the primary, he started looking for, it's expected that he's looking for near objects. And then you follow up for accommodative isotropias, for amblyopia, for refraction, for residual deviations, and re-measure at distance and near. And it's important to gradually taper this hyperopia as the child grows and the requirement decreases. Intermittent divergent squints, it's very important to remember that intermittent divergent squints require refraction, particularly if the vision is less than 6 by 6. A good high quality image is the most important stimulus to provide for control. Therefore, if you have a patient with myopia or high hyperopia even, it is an essential that you treat. For hyperopes, you may slightly undercorrect. However, myopes require optical correction for the best visual acuity. The, this is a modification of the AO guidelines, which are in red. And we recently had this discussion uh, where we established guidelines, which, which is a suggested guidelines uh, for Indian persons, Indian patients and children, some of which I have actually highlighted. Uh, this was released uh, yesterday in the inauguration, and I'm sure all of you would be giving it, getting it. But uh, essentially, as I discussed, these are important guidelines which tell us what is the cutoff when we should start uh, uh, giving glasses. And when to refract, it's very important the moment there is any misalignment, if there is any difference in the Bruckner's reflex, a refraction and prescription should be given. But it's again important that at every age there should be an identification, particularly by three years a comprehensive eye exam by an ophthalmologist at least once becomes essential. Again, like I said, atropine is our preferred for young children and for those with esotropia. After, and cyclopentolate can be an alternative, and if there is no strabismus, you can use any of the drugs. Uh, it's important to prescribe, uh, as we have discussed, these are the important conditions, but it's very important if children with uh, developmental disorders or delayed milestones, it's very important to prescribe as per retinoscopy because you are unable to often be able to do a PMT. So to conclude, pediatric prescription is not the same as that in adults. Important factors to consider are accommodation, visual needs, emetropization, the age, the amblyopic age up to six to seven years, and ocular al alignment, and a cycloplegic retinoscopy is a must. Thank you.